Well, good morning, and welcome to Community Life Church. My name is Scott Verno, and I'm the lead pastor here at this church, and it is an honor to welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, I apologize, I was catching up and, and enjoying spending time with some folks, so that's, that's why the four-second delay. But it's so good to see your smiling faces, it's so good to be home, and just looking forward to church today and being home with family. Um, Jim Bell was in Ireland for like... 25 days, and so I had to go over there and get them. Had to. Went over there, got them, and brought them back. And um, Jason has a picture, if you can go ahead and cue it up. Uh, last Sunday morning, so whatever six hours prior to this would have been, we were at the Cliffs of Moher, and um, we were trying to send back a video of us praying the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm just going to tell you that the winds were blowing 50 miles an hour, and so we prayed the Lord's Prayer 12 times, Jim. 15 times, I don't know, we did, so I want you to know you were well prayed for. We kept trying to record it, it was nuts. The one we finally got back, they couldn't hear us talking, they could only hear the wind. So I wanted you to see the picture of what we were looking at and we were thinking about and praying for you. And I tell you, there's no place like home. I'm so glad to, to be here. Uh, we got Jim back and, and, and I appreciate Brian and all the work that he did over these last few weeks. Love his heart and his, his desire to teach and so we appreciate that. And I'm um, just looking forward to see what God has in store for us. Amen? All right, I invite you, if you want to go ahead and stand. And uh, let's start this service off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. After much practice, um, let's, let's pray and really get our hearts together on the same page. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we love you. God, and it's, it's incredible how we navigate through this, this crazy, troubled world. Some days good, some days not so good. Uh, but in all of them, you're present to us. And um, you're ahead of us. Lord, you know the things that we're going to struggle with. And and so, God, you prepare us, you prepare our hearts. And so as we gather our, our lives together today, we think of our families, we think of our friends, we think of those people who've yet to experience the gospel message. And, and God, we pray that you would continue to open up their hearts and lives to allow them to experience something that goes beyond life itself. God, we just, we just lean into your presence today. We love you, and it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's a hymn for you called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you're in Ireland or back home here, we still have a friend in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins increase to bear. to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not Everything to God in prayer. Oh, here we trials and temptation. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it. Precious 
his Savior still I refuse Take it to the Lord in prayer And do our friends despise the sin and shield you just by your solace there you will find your solace there God thank you so much for this day thank you that we can come to you at any time Lord morning noon or night no matter where we're at and you're right there with us we ask your blessings on the service today. We ask your blessings on Jim as he delivers our Bible study. And on Scott as he delivers our continued series. And it's all in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I think it's morning. The clock says one thing. My body is telling me something totally different. It's like waking up at 2 and 3 in the morning and I wonder why everyone's not moving around. But it is good to be back. It was also a wonderful time to be away. You know, I could spend weeks upon weeks upon weeks upon telling you about what I saw and what we did. We were there with some great people. Uh, that, was, that was part of the fun of it, was just presenting Ireland to them the way we have seen it over the last seven or eight trips and just seeing their jaws drop as they, they take it all in. So I, it's a trip I heartily advise anyone who's never gone to start making your plans because it will, it will be a focal point of your life for the rest of your life. I want to thank Brian for filling in for the last, last three weeks. I caught him on, uh, on technology from, from over there. Of course, it was a little late in the afternoon when I saw it, which was good. Uh, but I'm, I appreciate uh, the time and the effort he put in. He gave a wonderful message. Lovely. And I'm glad you're back here today to hear more about Genesis, which we've been in for quite some time. So let's, uh, memory lesson here. When we were last together three years ago, we examined some of the causes for human hatred and warfare and it really began with the very first murder, and we see that taking place in chapter 4 of this book called Genesis. Now, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And already, in chapter 4, we're killing each other. Didn't take long. It did not take long. We saw what the New Testament confirms, that Wars and murders, they spring from something. They spring from the seeds of unreasoning jealousy within the heart of mankind and, and envy, which are allowed to lie on the human heart that are unjudged in that human heart. And when these things are small, they're, we don't think much about them. They're left unjudged. And they lie that way for a period of time, and then, all of a sudden, they break out. Men kill because they hate. They hate. And they hate because they don't want to accept God's ordering of the way life should work. Men actually just want to do it their own way. And they want, if they believe in God at all, they want God to act the way they want Him to act. You know, on their agenda, on their time frame. Well, today we examine a very closely related problem, and that's of race relations, the subject of human brotherhood. Because in this story of Cain and his brother Abel, it is highlighted for us by what followed the cold-blooded murder of Abel. So if you've got your Bibles... 
We are going to be in chapter 4 of Genesis. I'm going to read, first of all, a very familiar passage, which is verse 9. You've all known this one almost by heart. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, Am I my brother's keeper? You can almost taste the arrogance and the uncaring heart, the insolence in the way he responded to God. That's a sign of something. That's a sign of an inward and unacknowledged guilt. And that is always the way of guilt. It is to disclaim or get rid of all responsibility. So Cain replies, <coughs> and he says, My brother? My brother? What, I ha- what do I have to do with him? Am I, brother, am I my brother's keeper? Do I need to know everything about him and where he's at and where he's gone? Is it my responsibility to know where my brother is? And in those words, he claims absolutely no responsibility. Basically saying, it's not my job. It is not my job to do that. So this impudent and arrogant response to God is also an indicator of what's going on in Cain's heart at the very moment he took his younger brother's life. Because he would not have done so if he had not first gotten rid or got rid of himself of any of this awe or fear of God. He didn't fear God. He didn't have any awe of God. His open defiance of God speaks volumes of where his heart is. You know, some years ago, there was a book that was written by a man by the name of Dr. Carl Henry. And the book is entitled The Uneasy Conscience of Fundamentalism. And it troubled, and it gave a lot of problems to a great many people when it came came out, based upon what was going on in the church at that time. Now, we're not talking today. We're talking back a while. In it, Dr. Henry pointed out that the isolationism which many churches and a whole lot of Christians adopted, this isolationism removed us, if you will, from contact with non-Christians. You know, we were good amongst each other. We were good within our little club. But, you know, we didn't venture out outside of that club when we didn't even talk about or even address any of the social pressing issues of the day. Years ago, churches were oftentimes quite content, in fact, very content, about going, they would sing songs about going to heaven, and they loved that, and everyone sat back and felt good about it. But churches back then didn't show much concern for the sick or for the poor, the abused those that were disenfranchised, those that had injustices thrown at them, the widowed, the elderly. Those people weren't talked about. It it was an us versus them type of an approach. And I'll tell you, a lot of Christians back then did not really pay a whole lot of attention to what you read about in the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah, which is a ringing condemnation of that type of an attitude on the part of religious or spiritual people. You know, there are a whole bunch of passages from Scripture that make very, very, very clear that God is infinitely concerned in this area of life. People who bear his name should not and cannot and may not neglect these areas. You know, the church was never intended to minister only to those, to that one segment of society. You know, that society, that segment that had 
jobs, steady jobs, who had stability within the nuclear family. They had healthy and whole families, families that were settled, that were comfortable, that were responsible, families that had roofs over their heads and some sense of security and safety. What we read in the Bible was always intended to include all people, all classes, all colors, all economic standings, without making any distinction amongst them. And I don't care whether you're in the Old or the New Testament, you read words and script verses that are crystal clear about the truth of what I've just said. These distinctions are not to be ignored by the church. They must be. Otherwise, we are not being faithful to the one who called us and who he, who he himself was a great friend of all sinners and all those people in those categories I just mentioned. He was a great friend. So we need to be perfectly honest. We need to get rid of the blindfolds here and admit that this has been a weak spot in evangelical life over the years. Are we getting better at it? Well, I sure hope so. And I see signs of that. But it's been a weakness over the years in the church, this failure to move out in obedience to what God has to say and what God's command is to love, to, to have friendship, to forgive, to give grace and mercy to all people. And you know what? We're not even to think about their classification, if you will, their background, their heredity, whether they're doing life right, at least in our eyes. Now, these issues seem to take precedent over the issues of the church, and they really need to be addressed. You know, if we are still holding back, and if we are still reluctant to face <coughs> some of the things these passages reveal to us, maybe we need to just go back a little bit and look at Cain's punishment. What happened to Cain after he took the life of his brother? It's found in verses 10 through 12 in this chapter 4. Let me read that. The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opens its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops to you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Well, God is very, very vivid here. and He's, he's using something very in our face to describe his knowledge of what Cain did. Cain thought, uh, that he was working incognito. You know, he was covertly doing all this. No one would know about it. You know, no, no harm, no foul type of thing. Of course, we know, and he should have known, that God knows absolutely everything. Everything. God said, the blood of your brother cries out to me, from the ground. Abel's blood shouts at God. It's shouting at God, making demands upon his justice and his love. You know, we love to talk about God's justice. No, we don't. We love to talk about his grace and his mercy and how he's a friend and we are joint heir. But you know what? We can't talk about those things if we're not also talking about the fact that he is completely, perfectly just. He hates injustice. He wants to do something about it. If you go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 24, you'll read this. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. <clears throat> and what the writer of Hebrews means is that the blood of Jesus is crying out before God for forgiveness. 
You remember at the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The blood of Jesus is crying constantly for mercy, for grace, for all who take refuge under it. And therefore, it does speak of better things than the blood of Abel. It's much better than the blood of Abel. But there is a voice. There is, there is, the blood of Abel does speak to us as well. And that's what God is saying to Cain. Your brother's blood is crying something to me that I cannot ignore. I can't turn my head. I can't turn my back. It is shrieking to me. And it's coming from the ground. It's crying out. It's deafening. And what it's crying out for is redress. For vengeance. For justice. For the writing of something that was so evidently wrong. It's crying to a God of perfect justice. And it's saying this. Dear Lord, do not let this deed go unavenged. Do something. Sh shout it out. But something needs to be done about this. You know, it's important that we carefully notice that it is crying out for vengeance from God, not vengeance from man. We are told in both the book of Hebrews and the book of Deuteronomy that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You've heard that expression, that verse before. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance never, ever belongs to mankind. It is not man's task to avenge these things. You know the truth. When man assumes that role, guess what happens? Things get worse. They just worse. Falls apart. Because man, when he does that, unleashes a terrible cycle, a vicious cycle which gets greater and greater. It escalates and escalates rapidly into all-out anarchy and sometimes gets into civil war, revolution, something far above what it originally was intended. <coughs> but nevertheless, God is driven to act. This is what this ancient story of Cain and Abel is all about. This is what it tells us. God cannot allow these things to occur and nothing to happen as a result. His sense of justice is appealed to in this act that Cain put upon his brother. So what does God do? What does he do? He sentences Cain as the judge. He assigns a punishment. And the nature of it is very significant when we look at this punishment. It's important for us to see that God is not sending out, you're not reading about thunderbolts, you're not reading about plagues and infirmities and, and lame, and all those bad things. You're not, you're not reading any of this in, the, in this sentence. It's not there at all. There are no plagues, there are no floods, there's no pestilence. God does not take hold of Cain and shake him and take his life in vengeance. What happens is that what writers sometimes refer to, and you've heard this expression, it's poetic justice. It's really poetic justice. In other words, it's a strangely fitting result. Cain was what? He was a farmer. He was a toiler of the soil. He tilled it. He brought forth grain and fruit and vegetables. And he took a lot of pride in this work. He found joy in what he did. It's often said that a man's work is often his pride. And as a farmer, I want to tell you, Cain, no doubt, delighted in producing beautiful and delicious fruits, vegetables, and grains. But, and it's, here it is, but now he has poured the blood of his brother upon the very ground 
that his own life's work depended upon. So God says the ground, the arena of the pride of this man and the resource that makes it all possible is now going to be cursed toward him. The ground no longer is going to be yielding to him its full strength. It's no longer going to be his partner and his friend. Cain will now find in his attempts to work the soil, till the ground, he's going to feel and see nothing but frustration, sweat, tears, and hard labor. Everything is about to change for this man. So I think it's probably safe to say that if Cain had a green thumb, he lost it. Didn't have it anymore. The ground will no longer release its fruitfulness to him. His working of the ground will result in fruitless labor. In effect, Adam's curse regarding the tilling and the farming of the ground is magnified and amplified when it comes to Adam's son Cain. Because not only will farming become pretty much impossible, but Cain will also become a restless wonder. He would be forced to wander from place to place as the crops fail. In one place, he would be required to go somewhere else. So he was going to find himself unable to really extract a living. And this would turn him into a wanderer in the face of the earth. <coughs> you know, perhaps today, even today, we are still hearing the echoes of this strange sentence that was given to this man. Because all too often, all too often, we find ourselves being asked by God the same question. Where is your brother? And all too often, our answers mirror the same answer given by Cain. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, of course, we may not have physically killed our brother. We may not have physically harmed him. Be, but if we're totally honest, we have probably neglected him. We have forgotten him in our minds so very often. We put our own needs, our own desires, and we put them to the head of the line. And only if it is not too much of a distraction or a disturbance of the way we want to run our lives, do we act like our brother is indeed our brother? Let's be honest. It happens all too often. Remember the parable of the good Samaritan, a priest and a Levite, people anointed to do God's work on this earth. Or on the road, they pass by a man who is in very, very dire need of help. He's been beaten, he's been robbed, he's at the point of death. He needs urgent medical attention. And it's not the priest and it's not the Levite that even stopped. The fact is, they, not only did they stop, they walked on the other side of the road because you didn't want to get near someone like that. He's not one of us, he's dirty, he's unclean. But it's a despised Samaritan who tends to the man and ultimately is the one who restores him to health. Then Jesus asked the teacher of the law to whom he was talking, you know, one of the legal experts, which man was a neighbor to the one in need? And, and he answered correctly. He says it's the one who had mercy on him. He won't even use the word brother, though. He won't even use the man's name. He won't even call him a Samaritan. Just the one who had mercy on him. You can see it in his heart. He probably would have done the same. He would have walked on the other side because you don't want to get near someone who's injured or get near the blood because that would defile you. And, of course, you don't want to be associated with those people. The one who had mercy on him. Neighbor or brother. doesn't matter what you call them. They're all the same. 
This account, however, closes on a hopeful note. If you take a look at, starting at verse 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Notice something here that Cain gets very, very upset at the sentence God imposes on him. But not once, not one time in these verses does he mention his brother. Not once does he repent for what he has done. He feels no shame. He's not sorry about what took place. All he thinks about is himself. All he's thinking about is, what do I have to face? You know, verses 13 and 14 contain the words of Cain, and it is all about Cain. It's all about what is now about to happen to him. The words I, my, and me are spoken seven times. In two verses. Let me reread 13 and 14. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Truly today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be like a restless wonder on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. A lot of eyes, my's, and me's there, isn't it? Any sorrow contained in these words reflect his sorrow at being caught and punished. Not any sorrow for his horrific actions as he has committed a murder. And it's obvious from this account that Cain fears the vengeance of his other brothers. Now that always prompts a question. What other brothers are we talking about? We get to the very next chapter of Genesis in chapter 5, verse 4. We are told that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters besides the ones that are named in this scripture, Adam and Eve. There are other offspring here. <coughs> this is the explanation for the question that a lot of people have asked, like, where did Cain get his wife? Where did he get his wife? Well, unless God formed another woman similarly to the way he formed Eve, and we're not told that, that's not written there, we can't give that conjecture, it's pretty evident he married one of his sisters. And I want to tell you, that we, we sort of turn our heads and say, well, what's that all about? But we have to still remember that it was a common occurrence as late as the days of Abraham in the patriarchal times because Abraham married a stepsister. I'm sorry, a half-sister. And that was a common practice back then. So our, our buddy Cain here now knows that his life is in jeopardy no matter where he travels, no matter where he goes. Because wherever he goes, he's going to run into some relatives. He's going to run into some relatives, and he's afraid they're going to kill him. I think it's probably safe to say that Cain was not a big proponent of what we would call family reunions. He's obsessed about what his life will be like. He knows that he can't go anywhere in, so, in social society without constantly wondering about the attitudes that are being thrown at him 
by other people. Are they subtle? Are they sinister? Are they, were they, are they friendly? Are, can anyone be trusted? God said I wouldn't be killed, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to be treated very, very poorly. <coughs> so all of this is weighing him down. And he says to God, my punishment is more than I can bear. I will be a restless wonder on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. God counters, no, that's not going to happen. And he proclaims that whoever would kill him would suffer vengeance seven times over, much greater. God then places a mark on Cain so that anyone who found him would not kill him. Now, no one knows what that mark was. It's impossible to tell whether it was some physical manifestation or some physical mark he had on him, some sign on his body which indicated that he belonged to God, he was God's property, or not, we have no idea. Could have been just the fact that when he left Eden and going to Nod, he just had a helpless, pathetic look about him that would stir people's pity. He would become an object of pity to anyone that came in touch. We, don't, we just don't know. But the larger point is that even the guilty man is God's property. No question about the guilt here. But the guilty man is still God's property. God has thrown a circle of protection, a circle of protective love about Cain. And basically God is saying, yes, he is guilty. He is a murderer, but he's still my property. He still belongs to me. So don't forget this in your dealings with him. You know, we need to look at the mark of Cain differently. It's not a mark of shame, as we usually interpret it. It's always a lot of times interpreted that by people who read this. It's not a mark to brand him in the eyes of others as a terrible murderer, to be shunned, to be treated as a pariah. That's not it. Rather, the mark is a mark of grace by which God is saying, this man is my property. This man belongs to me. All you other people, hands off. He's mine. We see in this that the heart of God is always, always ready to show mercy. There can be only one reason why God protected Cain. And it was in order to give him time to reflect and to repent. You know, what we just read, there was no repentance in what we read about. I, my, 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 what you did to me. All that was focused on Cain. There's no repentance there. There's no reflection of what he's done. So the only reason why God protected Cain was to give him time to work through that repentance, to think about what, he took, what took place. And this is always the way that God works. In his second letter, <coughs> the Apostle Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Well, who's excluded from everyone? Who's excluded from anyone? No one. Murders, thieves, rapists. You name it. They're part of that group. Don't ever make the mistake of regarding the long-suffering of God as a weakness. He's patient. Some people will say, good Lord, 21 centuries of Christian life have gone by and nothing has happened. And then they say, God will never do anything about righting wrongs. 
Don't think that that indicates any impotence upon the power of God to do what he will when he wants to do it. It is strictly God's mercy and strictly God's grace that gives men and women like you and me and, and people who are unchurched time to repent, to think about our lives, to go back and see how we fit into these stories. And it gives us time to reflect. And we need to repent in order that no one, no one may perish. It's not his, it's not his desire. He is patient. 21 centuries? That's what that means. The guy's like a snap of a finger. And he is that powerful to make it happen anytime he chooses. But the key is, is we should never, as believers or unbelievers, ever presume upon God's patience forever. We need to utilize the time given to us precious time to repent to change to accept the gift of God in the presence and the blood and the body of Jesus Christ it is all grace for us right now so we need to also get busy to express that grace and mercy to our brother. Will you bow your head with me? Lord, this is a tough lesson. And Lord, when we place ourselves into these, these stories, we, we see that, boy, there's part of Cain in, in the way we act and the way we behave. There's part of Abel in the way we act and behave. And Lord, it is is beyond our, our, the scope of our imagination, the love you have for us, that, that even with all we do, all that we fail to do, your love never fails. You look at each and one of our ones and say, he is mine, she is mine, hands off, hands off. They are mine. I will take care of them. I will redress all the fallings that have taken place, but it will be in my time, and it is I who will do it. Lord, give us the strength to look at our own heart as you see it, not as we see it. And Lord, when we do, may we continue to offer praise and glory to the Son who died that we might be in your presence, not just for a day, but forever. It's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen. It's great to be back. Great to see you. Have a great week.